We're going to talk about the drivers, a little bit about some codes and standards, um, then talk about the state of the practice, which is more of kind of the, the procedural side of things, and then look at what we're seeing kind of out in the immediate future. Um, we're going to look at, uh, you know, just what is the foundation? So when we talk about drivers, and, and probably in simple form, we're trying to keep outside out and inside in, right? We have an enclosure and it's really just to, to create that boundaries. And we will talk a little bit about interior enclosure commissioning where we have different interior spaces, maybe temperature, humidity, um, but predominantly it's outside versus inside. And of course, mother nature is what we're trying to create that separation from, and we have a wide variety of climates when you look across uh, the world, even across the US. Um, so what are the things that we're most concerned about? Well, our whole industry came about because of water leakage. So this is not a water test, this is just a rain, and we have a disappointed owner, right? There is uh, you know, quite a bit of moisture coming into that. This was a part of the country, that, or part of the world that I get to go to every once in a while, that they get less than one inch of rain a year. The problem is it all comes at one time. So just because you don't get a lot, what you really have to understand is the intensity, right? And so if you get a lot of rain at a, at a short period of time, that can be just as se severe from a water leakage standpoint as an area where it rains all the time and it's more spread out. Um, where it leaks, uh, particularly into a building, can be very important to the owners. In this particular case, this was where a linear accelerator was going to go. And every day that this room was down, and it would be down if it had a water leak, it cost the hospital a quarter million dollars. So you can imagine that was a, that was a big uh, challenge for them. So, and when the below grade waterproofing's on, there's a lot of things with enclosure, you get one chance to get it right. And if you don't get it right, you're getting backhoes and doing very expensive things just to find one little hole that would have caused uh, that leak. And so it can be, first of all, challenging to, to, to find the problem and then uh, expensive to solve the problem. We get involved, um, a, a lot of us in this profession uh, started off by doing more forensics investigations and so forth. And uh, so you get pretty good at understanding how you can mess up buildings. In this particular case, um, there was a loose laid flashing and the architect didn't like the look of the flashing so they cut it way back so you can't see it. Well, they can't see it, which I guess was okay from aesthetics, but what happened is the water hit the flashing hit the edge of the flashing and ran back underneath the flashing, found a gap in the lintel and entered in the building. And it was entered in at the top of the, of the window head. So what does it get reported as? Window leaks. Nothing to do with the window. Window leaks, right? So we get a lot of that. We show up at a lot of times and people say, I know exactly what the problem is. Okay, well, let's, let's start where you're seeing it and we'll go from there. Um, this was uh, just a, a, a very easy to make mistake on a submittal where somebody uh, specified a two-stage drain, which means it has drainage at two different levels, and they installed it in a single-ply roof, which means there's only drainage at the top level. And so the first time you had a little snow and ice built up in the, in the um, drain, the, uh, the, the drain has holes there underneath the membrane level, and so we were draining back under our roof which caused the insulation to cup and somebody got a whole new roof. So um, we talk a lot about indoor air quality and there's, there's ties with enclosures to, to, to all of this. Um, I would say that, that mold and so forth is probably the reason that people in my profession have a job. Um, and that is, you know, 20 years ago, it, it, it became a hugely expensive problem for folks and, and remains to be that in terms of that exposure from having leakage and, and mold growth. Um, and we talk about indoor air quality, uh, but what about exter exterior air quality? You know, we work in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, where you don't want to be outside. You, know, you turn on the news and they say it's an index 10 or whatever that means today, don't go outside. Um, and so sometimes we want to protect that outside because it's not always clean air when you open the window. Um, case in point, this is our office building, one of our office buildings over in, in um, uh, this is in Guangzhou, China, and it's a seven-year-old building and I, I was looking around at the building. If you, I don't know if you could see the base of that column there, but the base of the column as a whole, you could put your hand through. Do you think they have some acid rain? Do you think they have some, some you know, nasty environment that uh, really prematures, prematurely uh, degrades things? So, and, and other things to think about. You know, we do a lot of work in Phoenix and in the, in the desert and so forth, and if you think people care about water leaks and air leaks, they certainly don't want sand coming into their building or sand plugging up weep holes and so forth, and that can be a big thing. So really understanding that environment is a huge driver 
for, for commissioning services. You know, it's not just sand coming in, but it's also abrasion, you know, and, and how durable finishes are and so forth. We've had to become chemists, and this is, this is the part of the profession I didn't understand when we first got into, when now all of a sudden, um, instead of just having a, uh, a sheet good that we're putting up, now we have component A and component B on day C being sprayed applied on you know, a Friday afternoon. And uh, so we're, we have on-site chemistry, we have different materials that are now touching each other, um, and it's gotten very complex uh, very quickly. And things that, that look good on paper don't always work out so well in the field. So when we look at uh, you know, facade elements and we, we look at things like durability, we learned um, you know, in, in the early 90s, late 80s about some of the challenges with uh, different systems. In this case, this is EVE systems and, and with, with sealing of, of uh, EVEs to finish coats. To, so the, basically the finished coat was coming off of the base coat. Um, and there's, there's challenges and there's lessons learned in the industry, but this doesn't condemn EFs necessarily because we now have newer technologies and techniques to do it. But you have to understand the chemistry, you have to understand the physics and, that, and the history um, to avoid premature degradation. Because regardless, at the end of the day, you've got a disappointed owner at the least, you've got a lawsuit uh, more likely. We see a lot of new products. Um, this is a theme that you're gonna hear over and over again today. When the euro is 30 cents uh, you know, less than it used to be on the dollar, guess how many uh, imports we are? What's an easy thing to make that you can import? A panel. What's that panel made from? How long is it going to last? Well, not long enough in this particular case. And so it can be very challenging to try to stay ahead of the market with all of the new products that are coming out. And, um, and we have some very creative architects, and architects want to use a wide palette of materials, as they should. Um, but you, we have to make sure that the science is there. And the hardest thing uh, from, the, from the testing lab standpoint to deal with is durability. Simulating time is difficult. Speeding up time is very difficult. Um, this was a project that we worked on actually fairly close by here. And uh, we had an air barrier system. And in this particular case, it was challenging because the, um, the windows had a very specific location where they needed to receive that primary air and water seal. And it was way outside of where that air barrier, so the air barrier is the black part, and you see that collar flashing, that colored flashing around the window. That extended the, the, the air barrier three or four inches out so they can receive that fenestration seal. The problem is the masonry came in, and when the mason came in, things didn't fit. So guess what? We made it fit, right? Jam it in there. And now all of a sudden, we have a huge problem, right? We've just, we've just voided our, our air and water barrier and, and in a very uh, concerning area, at, at essentially at all the corners. And so, you know, people trying to do the right things, not, not necessarily, you know, doing this anything intentionally, but um, certainly a problem. So we look at things, again, the durability plays a huge impact on the commissioning role. So this was, a, this was a Ford I made for my kids, and I told my kids it was going to last until May. It lasted, uh, I think, into the first week of April. So I had disappointed owners. You know, it did not meet their expectations in this case. And then we have other buildings that are supposed to last forever, right? And, um, and so the commissioning exercise, whether you're commissioning a big box store or a warehouse distribution center, or you're commissioning a monument or you know, an institutional type building that has a 250 year design life, the effort should change. The amount of approach that you take toward the materials and the construction and, and the vetting of those materials um, should change. So we have some other drivers that we're gonna get into uh, beyond just think how things fail and, and being safe and durable. Um, we'll talk on the energy front a little bit. So specific to the building enclosure, um, there's three different factors that, that really play a part in the energy equation on building enclosures. Solar heat gain, U-factor, and air leakage. And we'll, we'll spend a little bit of, of time on each of those. So air leakage was one, one of our topics, so we'll try to spend even extra time on that today. Um, so solar heat gain is, um, is probably the most obscure of them because it's not something that's visual. Not, air leakage, I guess, isn't real visual either. Um, and there's two different d devices that you see on the screen. Uh, the device on the left is, is the U-shaped one, is very useful for verification of existing solar heat gains of products. 
So this, this is a very common type of equipment if you have the, uh, the building where they say, hey, we're gonna change out the windows and you're gonna get a rate of return on six and a half years for changing these windows out, changing the glass out and everything, and you're gonna be great. If you don't know where you're starting from, from a solar heat gain, you're putting garbage into that energy model and your rate of return investment probably is miscalculated. And so understanding what that initial value is is important. The machine on the lower left there is a solar calorimeter and that's what gets the uh, solar heat gain coefficient for new products, specifically uh, transparent glass type products. So um, on this line, so it's, solar heat gain is important for energy. In this case too, it's also um, can, can be important for performance. Uh, this is a project that I was fortunate enough to do in Bermuda, not a, not a bad assignment. Um, and this was after the fact. And so we showed up and the, the problem was that the building mechanical systems were unable to keep up. Um, they weren't able to cool, this, cool the building. Anyone want to guess what, what time of year this was? I gave you some hints. We talked about solar heat gain and inability to keep up. What time of year? Not summer. Winter. Not winter. The other two answers are exactly right. <laughs> Spring and fall. And so what happened is it's the low incident angle of the sun, right? So there's more solar load on those two times a year. And it was just, it was that cooling load caused by the solar. The interesting thing with this one, this was one of the only cases that I took where the architect took 100% of the payment. Contractor didn't take anything. And you know why? The owner didn't like the color of the glass sample that came in, that little 12 by 12 sample. It was too green, and they wanted blue. So they got blue. When they got blue, they got 30% less performance on their solar heat gain, and, uh, and the rest is history. So as soon as that architect stamped approved on the blue sample, their fate was sealed, unfortunately. And so. Um, challenging, you know, could it be, a, could it have been, you know, solved with some redundancy, maybe shading and other things? Yeah, perhaps, but, um, you know, difficult thing. Um, window-to-wall ratios are important. So we, we're starting to see some, some code-mandated window-to-wall ratios, and so the idea is that uh, the windows are, are far less performing compared to opaque walls, therefore um, we're going to dictate to design professionals and others how much percentage you can have of window. I think we're doing some real creative things on the fenestration side that we can, we can do some prescriptive uh, measures to, to increase it. And obviously, we see buildings uh, that have nearly 100% fenestrations. So, um, other things. So, when you look at energy, um, thermal discontinuity, this is U factor. And, um, you know, we love, we love the, the ASHRAE. Um, uh, 90.1 and, and all the appendices and so forth that tell you the reductions. But the reality is when you have construction, you have additional concerns. And there's a lot of things that those tables can't uh, really accurately predict. So for example, somebody missing a stud bay with insulation or we have a real heavy gauge steel angle around every single fenestration on the project. And, uh, and those are things that can really affect the thermal performance. Um, there's a couple documents in here. If you guys have trouble sleeping like I do, um, you can read. This is, this is a, good, a very good document, but it gets um, you know, fairly granular. So ASHRAE 1365, um, some of our um, uh, peers in the, in the industry put this together. And it's really neat because it looks at linear point and field thermal anomalies, and it gives you good, better, and, and best detailing for some of those things, so for some common conditions like continuous balconies, and in this case, a, a, a rooftop um, condition where we have a roof-to-wall interface. When we get into the air side of the equation, um, the very first thing that you have to understand is what is inside and what is outside. So this was a job that I showed up on mid-construction, and they said, you know, we really need to have an airtight building, and I was standing in this room, and it was a nice view out there, and we were looking out, and I said, wait a minute, I'm standing on a roof. So to somebody, that means this is outside. Yet, and there's a louver that's going in there, so this must be outside. And then I looked up at the ceiling, and every place there was a flute in the deck, I could put my hand through to the adjacent room. So what this was, I was in an, in, an air intake, right? This was, a, this was a duct with a whole bunch of holes in it. So we didn't have any kind of boundary between inside and outside, but nobody put it together because the roofer said, well, I'm just gonna roof it here just to be good. But, the, but nobody was looking at it from a, from a holistic perspective. Um, the other thing that became painfully obvious, and this was probably about 10 years ago now, was when we first started to have conversations with energy modelers about inputs for the building enclosure, it became very apparent that we were not speaking the same language. 
We wanted to talk in terms of six sides of a building. They wanted to talk in terms of four. We wanted to talk 75 pascals. They wanted to talk 50 pascals. We wanted to talk CFM per square foot of facade area. They wanted to talk air exchanges per hour. And so if you don't get the units the same, if you don't get on the same uh, page in terms of usually boiling it down to a CFM at a defined pressure, you might as well not have the conversation. And um, so too often we've seen kind of garbage in, garbage out scenarios in models, and then we're making decisions on models. I don't know about you guys, but we're seeing energy modelers now early on design development, schematic design, programming, now dictating design because of what the model's putting out. And it's kind of, there, there's nothing wrong with that, but we got to make sure that we're putting the right information in the model. So a um, couple of things. I think, you know, when we do look at, at uh, air leakage and, and how it's accounted for in the models, I do think that we have some work to do as an industry. I think that in general, um, the, the studies that I've seen seem that the, the traditional energy modeling is under appreciative of the amount of energy savings that air tightness can have. Um, and I think that some of that has to do with um, a lot of the studies that were done in the past were on lower R value wall systems. So that same quarter inch hole on a high R value wall system has a greater impact on the overall energy performance than that quarter inch hole does on the older low R value wall systems. And, uh, and it's really just catching up some of those things. So when this is some of the best data that, that we have in terms of the actual input of energy modeling and when you look at air leakage and energy usage, and this is on a building by building basis, and this is on after a couple of years of service life. But you can see, just, this is all just in the state of Utah, where we have a huge variance from 4% all the way up to 31% annual savings by having a very tight building compared to a, a um, twice thin code leakage building, which at the time we considered to be the average building. And so that's a, that's a huge delta, right? And so the type of mechanical system, how much makeup air, um, there's a lot of factors that go into that, but on average, it's still appreciable. When you're looking at, um, for the DFCM's estimates, and 10 to 15% of annual savings just by getting, um, a, well, I would say good air leakage performance. And when I say good air leakage performance, I'm talking about four times tighter than code minimum, um, as, as, as should be your target for high performance. And, uh, and when, you, when you get that, that's an appreciable savings on an annual basis. Some of the other things that didn't hit me right away, but as consumers, I don't know if you've noticed, but our expectations have gone up higher. We all have that friend that's always too hot or too cold, right? Like if it's not 72 degrees plus or minus a half degree, they're like totally uncomfortable. Well, that's, our society has become like that, where we have a higher expectation for being able to control the environment. And so there's, there's social drivers, there's environmental drivers, there's sustainability drivers also uh, for the commissioning effort. So we look at um, it's, sa it's saving time, and this is, this is a driver on a lot of projects now. And um, we, we talked about, uh, one of the questions was, how can we do commissioning without a mock-up? Well, um, I'm gonna say that the mock-up is one of the fundamental ways of saving time on a project. And what it is, is it's trying to get that educational learning part of the mock-up done that's disassociated from the construction schedule. So we're not trying to learn things and do things at the same time. Um, the other thing too is uh, a lot of times if, if you, the commission effort um, can help you dry the building in faster. So when you look at the, the construction schedule, most of the time what they're trying to do is they're trying to get to the point where they can do interior finishes. And you can't do interior finishes until you can separate outside from inside. And you can't do that until you have air barriers and windows and roofs and those types of things involved. And so when you can do those things, and you can do those things prior to putting in heavy claddings like masonry and so forth, now all of a sudden you've got a discussion point for saving some real time on a project. So um, that's, that's certainly been a driver too. So we'll look at some codes and standards. And I, this is my least favorite part of the, of the presentation, so I didn't put a whole lot of slides into it this time. Um, for it, but uh, one, of the, one of the earliest standards, and there's, there's guidelines and there's standards. Um, one of the earliest standards is, is a Canadian standard, the Z320 that, that came out back in 2011. And uh, this, is, this is kind of interesting. The building and closure part of that is called architectural systems, but it does speak to whole building commissioning. This is the first time that I've seen that a country said, hey, we're gonna have a national code 
albeit not enforced, but a national code that speaks to whole building commissioning. So that was nice for them to kick it off, and it included um, some annexes on testing and so forth. Um, the, in the U.S., the only standard that's out there right now is ASTM uh, 2813, and that came out in 2012. There's an Epsilon 1 version that I think was two years ago that came out, had some clarifications on the OPR and the required testing and so forth. And then um, many of you may have heard of NIBS before, so NIBS Guideline 0 and then NIBS Guideline 3, um, and uh, Fiona and others that are in the room here it had a lot to do with, with producing those documents, which was uh, terrific. It was the first guideline in the States, way ahead of its time back in 2006, and that's now part of the ASTM family of documents. Um, and so what we're trying to do as an industry is kind of bring things together. But, um, you know, one of the questions earlier was, how do you price commissioning? Well, one of the hardest things to price is we don't have a collective standard. When someone says enclosure commissioning, it means something different probably to most of the people in the room here. And so um, whether it's 2813 or NIBS Guideline 3 or, or LEAD V4, it could have a, a significant impact on, um, on the price. So identifying the scope or the standard to follow is important. Um, when you look at air leakage requirements, too, one of the questions we had, I'm trying to remember all these, was uh, zones one and two, you know, are, there's no requirement for air barrier leakage. Well, that might be true on kind of the national level. When you look at states like we're in right now, the state of Florida, they have a very uh, detailed uh, requirements in their energy code. Um, for the state of Florida. So you do have to have an air barrier. Um, and uh, so what we're seeing uh, is, I think, a little bit into the future, what we're going to get is something better than where we have right now. So in the code right now, you'll look at it, and um, it'll say for air barriers, there's a material requirement, which is that machine there, which is just a meter by meter square, no penetrations, we'll tell you what the leakage rate is, and that's a .004. And then there's an assembly, which is a, a material with some holes punched in it and um, still laboratory controlled environment. And then there's the whole building, which is way too late after the, after the job's done. And all they've done is they've moved the decimal place one time, so 0.004 to 0.04 to 0.4, and they said, if you comply with any one of these three, just pick one, you've got an air barrier. So you can have a material, it may not be continuous, it may not even be practical to install it in the same fashion, and you've checked that box for code. Um, I think what we're seeing is that um, ASHRAE and some other groups are really pushing for the whole brain air test, which is, which is great because that's real world performance. I mean, that is what, what it's doing. The only challenge is it's after the fact. So we haven't learned anything on the job. We've learned where we ended up, but we haven't necessarily made it better. Um, so we have some states like the state of Washington and so forth that do require that in New York City. So um, there's also vapor barrier requirements in codes too. So uh, we had two questions, I believe, on lead V4. And so when you look at um, lead V4, uh, it, the, the envelope did um, get a little bit stronger presence. Uh, we, we are now uh, twice as much of a bike rack from V3. We were equivalent to a bike rack in V3, which was a, not, not terrific, maybe. But uh, so when you look at the fundamental and the enhanced, and I won't read all these to you, but I, I do think the nice thing about V4 is there's a table now in V4 that tells you at least the basic scope items that should be included if you're going enhanced commissioning, and enclosure is one of the two options there for that, and it's now two points. Um, very quickly, we'll look at some, some building science stuff real quick. So we talked about environmental separation, keeping inside in and outside out. We're predominantly looking at water, air, vapor, and thermal. Um, more and more we start seeing acoustical and um, fire start to come into the equation. If you're up in Canada, acoustics is, is part of their defined layer to, um, to have environmental separation. Um, and just a couple of concepts. Um, this, is, this is the concept that's, that's known as the perfect wall. And the reason it's known as the perfect wall is because it's really hard to get something growing in this wall. And that is that the, the, the moisture in the dew point is always in a location where it's collected and weeped back out to the, inside, uh, to the outside. So there's no point where you can get condensation inside of your air and vapor barrier in this case, which is that heavy black line right there. And then the blue is the insulation, so your dew point's always in the blue. And uh, all your moisture that gets into this layer is, is now evacuated out the bottom. You could do the same thing for the roof, and you can do the same thing for the wall. We don't always get this. In some cases, we don't often get this. And so there's tools that we can use, and um, some are 
are better than others. This is a kind of a, a steady state condition that's more spreadsheet based for dew point calculations or you can get into two dimensional um, modeling. This is uh, used commonly for fenestrations in terms of therm or you can get into two or three dimensional hygrothermal analysis where you're actually looking at not just temperature gradients but you're looking at drying capacities too. So the point is not to elaborate on these, but there's tools that are available when you get into those scenarios that you don't feel so good about. You're looking at it, you're saying, I wonder if we have a dew point problem here. Um, just macroscopically, taking a step back and looking at um, where, where we are at as an industry, you know, we have to remember that there's a project life cycle. Almost all of our projects start off as dust and they return to dust, right? And we may pick them up on new construction commissioning early. We may pick them up on existing building commissioning later. But there's, there's a process for, for every building. And not only that, is there's, there's a cycle. Um, and we, we'll see lots of times people say, hey, I, it's in construction phase. Hey, I need you to commission our building. Well, you know, commissioning is a process that involves verification of materials, design, and construction. And you can't really just pick and choose one of those pieces and say, hey, we're going to do commissioning. Um, so you have to have a good balance between kind of those three three peers of, of, of modern construction, if you will. Um, and just to, to give you a couple ideas of some, some tests, this was a test that we do this is using live explosives um, out in Texas. So this is an arena blast test. We found out the hard way that if the clouds are low enough, you can blow out the windows in a gas station three miles away for doing this test. Um, <laughs> There's some, there's some other testing that, uh, that's done. And, and there's a whole lot of information that goes on to these product cut sheets that you see. So when you get these cut sheets and you're looking at performance, in this case, this is a piece of vinyl siding. And we're going to shoot a calibrated hail. My kids love that. I take them into the lab and they say, wow, dad, look at this. Somebody made a perfectly round snowball. And we shot this uh, piece of ice at a, at a piece of vinyl siding. And it looks like it did all right there. In today's world, we have to worry about we. Uh, we, this is our mob protection. So this is forced entry resistance. They're trying to put a backpack bomb through the fenestration in 15 minutes, and they have a battering ram and 48-inch bolt cutters and uh, all kinds of crazy things. So unfortunately, I'm too old to do that test now. And we have other tests, too. Like this is a, a test that has gotten um, more prevalent in our codes, NFPA 285. And so it used to just be for thermoplastics and installation, insulation, and now it's expanded to uh, weather resistant barriers as well uh, for buildings over a certain height. And so this is a common test, almost a project specific test. We almost burned our building down on this one actually. Um, you, you can see the, the size of the hose here in a minute, this guy. It's, it's uh, not, not the fire department you want showing up at your house. So anyways, live and learn. And then I just wanted to, to just touch upon a couple of things too, because we, we get these questions all the time. You know, is there a difference between commissioning and, and consulting, um, and, and a absolutely, there is, you know, and so when you look at consulting, um, and most of us grew up as consulting when, before commissioning existed, and you can jump in and jump out of a project whenever you want it. You want to take just a little piece, you can do that. Um, a lot of the exercise was, you know, in all honesty, focused around limiting your, your reliability as a consultant. Um, it was not a very accountable process. And, uh, and, and I'm not saying consulting is bad, but I'm saying that, uh, you know, it was based on, based on more standards. And th that's from a testing standpoint. So in, the, in consulting, it was always like, well, we have this standard and we're going to follow this standard and so forth. When it gets into commissioning, I like to think it's based more on real world. We're trying to keep Mother Nature out, so let's try to get close to Mother Nature. It may not be exactly to a standard, but let's try to do what we can to get exactly to the condition that we're trying to simulate. Um, there is more accountability. I mean, there's nothing more nervous than doing a whole billion air test on a building that you just commissioned, and you made promises to the mechanical engineer that really wanted to have a high factor of safety and more, more oomph there, and you said, nope, we're going to make this real efficient, and we're going to drive this performance as good as we can, and then the, then the day comes where you've got to do the whole billion air test. And so there is accountability for that. And it's performance-based, but most importantly, it's a formalized process. There's a start, there's an end. There's required tasks that you have to do. And uh, you can't really just jump in and jump out. So um, there's other things that you will see that are not necessarily commissioning, but maybe occurring on projects. So codes and special inspections, for example. Um, so when you have... Um, 
out west, we've seen this a lot, and, it, and it's actually you know throughout now where architects, um, you know, and, and there's tools like BIM and so forth, and so we have to incorporate the commissioning practice in, into these. But what we're seeing is that um, certain times, uh, you know, the architect is even subcontracting out portions of the design, like the waterproofing, to consultants to do. So we have a civil set, we have a structural set, we've got a landscape set, and sometimes you'll see a WP set where there are actual waterproofing details and they'll come to consultants to help them um, develop those types of details. And so that's been, that's been more last five, 10, 10 year type stuff. Um, but even wood, f wood frame multifamily residential. So now getting back to the commissioning side of things, um, and I don't touch too much on this, but there is a lot of work when it comes to biosafety labs, um, you know, someone came by the booth today and they were saying, you know, have you ever come across, you know, pressure decay testing? Absolutely. And um, so when there are nasty things, whether it's a, it's a, um, a, a biosafety lab or whether it's a hospital or whether it's a natatorium or a museum, you can have varying interior conditions where the same fears of your outside wall could be realized in your inside walls. Um, this is a concept that I hope kind of resonates. And so when, when I look at commission, I think of commission, I think, okay, you have your primary systems. You got your, your MEP commissioning, which there's probably a lot of MEP providers in the room, you know, controls I throw in there. And then you got your secondary systems, which is more like enclosure, your technology, your life safety systems, and then maybe the subsystems of security, waste, and lighting, and some of those things. And so we, when I like to have, the conversation that I like to have is, it goes a little bit something like this. Uh, what are you trying to achieve? And this is the discussion with an owner early in the project. What kind of performance is important to you? You know, so it's durability, it's leakage, it's energy performance, it's, you know, code minimum performance, maybe for fire or things like that. Um, but if you just look at energy, for example, look at all of the different systems that energy touches. And so if you're and this is what we always see, is we always see an RFP that says system be commissioned, boom, 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 and it just puts envelope down there, right? But it's not necessarily getting to the heart of the question because what they really want is energy performance or maybe they want acoustical performance and maybe that touches different things, you know, or maybe they want air quality performance and you look at air quality performance and it touches different systems and so forth. And so I would encourage you to have those conversations with the owners to talk about what they're trying to look from a performance standpoint and not just a system standpoint. Now it gets fairly complex even within the enclosure umbrella uh, because all of these things may be applicable to a project. Certainly every project has a certain combination of these things, but it could be, you know, the waterproofing and the roofing or glazing could have mock-ups or testing, or it could be deal with solar or durability, fire, acoustics. And the problem is, um, and I've seen this on the MEP side too, you know, your, your best controls person is typically not your best mechanical or electrical engineer. I mean, these are, dare I say, different professions, right? Most of these are different professions. So if you have an enclosure person, person, not plural, person, it's hard for them to be an expert in all of these things. And so normally, even the enclosure exercise is a team. It's a team sport, right? So your best roofer is not your best glazer, is not your best air barrier person, is not your best testing person, generally speaking. Okay, we'll get into a little bit of the process and then we'll get into some of the, some of the future stuff. So um, again, it's a, it's a process that more often than not starts in pre-design now or even programming, which is great because that didn't used to happen. Um, we're, we are certainly being asked to join on earlier and earlier and then ends in, in O&M. Um, but you have to have some kind of design component in there, in my opinion. Um, so when you look at the design or pre-design, these are the things, you're looking at objectives. A lot of value engineering now is happening in pre-design. Um, talking about roles and responsibility is, and communication in the, in the building commissioning plan. Um, and then a documented OPR. Very rarely do you go up to an owner and they have a written enclosure OPR for you. It's happened twice to me. And, uh, you know, very rare occurrence. So you have to get it out of them. You have to ask the questions. Again, what's important to you, Mr. and Mrs. Owner? Um, doing drawing reviews, typically multiple drawing reviews. They might be fairly uh, brief and schematic and might be getting more detailed into CDs. Um, we're typically writing two specification sections, a commissioning specification session, a session and a functional performance test spec. Um, and then uh, updating the, the plan and the OPR. And so when you're writing the functional performance test spec, 
you have to understand how things fail. So if you know someone's going to bend a masonry tie after they spray them, or you know they're going to put horseshoe shims on for their Z-girts, then you want to build that criteria into the test spec. So we like to write a division one test spec because the owner doesn't care if that window works. They care if the window works in the context of the roof and the adjacent wall and all the materials. They just don't want it to leak. They want everything to work together. And so if we write a division one spec, we're talking about things working together. And it can supersede some of the, some of the testing requirements and things in the other, uh, or work in harmony, obviously, in, in the other uh, division seven and eight spec sections. Um, so in a lot of cases, the ASTM do not have defined pass fail criteria, so you have to build that in. Um, so design reviews, there's, there's written comments. This is a, a graphical representation of what's going on. Um, and again, you know, we're trying to always think about real world condition versus what's on a piece of paper. And so when you're doing the design reviews, you're, you're trying to use your experience to make sure that if there's challenges in the field with maybe origami or things that are not concealed for UV protection that needs to be caught in the drawings, or maybe there's you know, not enough space to put a sealant joint in, or there's an incomplete tie between the roof system and the wall system. I mean, just think how much air you hemorrhage if you have a discontinuity between your roofing and wall system. Um, other things to think about too, we talked about inside and out. We have conditions like this where we have a, a curtain wall that shoots past a roof. So now we have two sides of a curtain wall that are both outside going to down below where one's inside, one's outside. A lot of detailing has to go in to make sure you can avoid leakage and condensation problems. Soffit conditions are always problematic, um, you know, when you have roof-to-wall interfaces. Um, for years and years, roofs only needed to do two things. They needed to keep water out and needed to allow you to re-roof. Well, in this particular case, we have three things now. We have to be airtight as well. It doesn't have to be at the membrane level. It could be at the, at the vapor barrier level. But we have to think of things more than just keeping water out and, uh, and re-roofing. And air is three-dimensional, so it'll go right up underneath that metal counter flashing very easily you know, foundation walls and so forth. So when you look at, um, you know, just the amount of maybe um, instructions or, um, and, and again, this isn't, it, there's a little different than consulting when you're providing commissioning comments because it's always in the context of the OPR. You're trying to make sure that you're, you're providing the technical coaching about the ability of the design to meet the OPR. So um, just talking a little bit more about design, you know, simple is good, and we don't, most of our buildings don't look like that, probably from an architectural standpoint, thankfully. Um, but from a commissioning standpoint, this is a dream, right? We have no penetrations. We don't even have any weep holes. This is over in the Middle East. Um, but redundancy is good. In this particular case, we're putting on a fluid applied air barrier inside a precast concrete. And it's not that precast concrete can't be an air barrier, but most concrete cracks and cracks can leak, and this gives extra protection against leakage um, when you apply it across the wall system. You know, constructability is a huge concern. So when a guy has to use a 10-pound sledgehammer to, to install a unitized curtain wall, that's probably not by design, right? And so maybe there was something we could have done earlier to look at some of those constraints for putting that together. Um, so when we move into the pre-construction phase, which may be the most important phase on the commissioning process, we have things like the mock-up. So I know one of the questions was, how do we commission without a mock-up? I like mock-ups. I, even if a mock-up is just the first build, to just say to execute the work, that's an in-situ mock-up meant to be part of the work, I would highly encourage you to do a mock-up of some sort. So we have all different varieties from a laboratory mock-up to a freestanding site mock-up to a, more of an in-situ mock-up. And um, you know, your project budget plays a big part as to what you can do. I think there's a lot of projects now that we're seeing going to the freestanding, what I'll call parking lot style mock-up as an economy, um, an, an economical choice. Uh, but still getting a lot of the value. You can do a whole building air test on that mock-up. You can get that number and maybe sleep a little easier as you're going through construction phase before that whole building air testing night. So, you know, you're verifying for the first time that the actual tradespeople and design can accomplish what you're trying to accomplish or not. And if you're doing some learning, because we're testing before any claddings are on and everything, you can get in and easily repair things and 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 change things um, and get and and very quickly identify where that source is. Um, so a couple other things, you know, who should be there. This should be involved, you know, it should involve everybody. Um, there's some other uh, two real important things that happen in the pre-construction phase, and that is submittal reviews and, a, and some kind of kickoff meeting. Um, you really need to walk people through, especially if they haven't been involved in enclosure commissioning, what their obligation is, what their role is in the process, what the testing is. 
What are success and failure stories from the past? And I think that communication is very key. Um, so when you get into constru construction, um, I've had a lot of people think that construction is when commissioning starts. Uh, commissioning has to be full-time inspection. Uh, it couldn't be farther from the truth in either case. All you're doing in construction is verifying that that success you've already demonstrated in pre-construction is now continuing throughout the process. So it's more periodic checks and so forth. Um, and you're you know, verifying the systems, you are witnessing testing, or in some cases performing testing, um, updating the commissioning plan and some of the commissioning deliverables in terms of uh, verifying that the checklists are completed and so forth, and typically drafting the report. So just a couple of things here uh, real quick on the, on the testing side, and I think Fiona, you've got, a, you've got a session tomorrow that might get into more detail on the testing side. But some of the important things to think about is if, if you want to do smoke testing, and smoke testing can be a valuable testing, and sorry for the audio, but when you do this test, if you don't put in pass-fail criteria into your spec section, don't rely on ASTM to do it, because there is no pass-fail criteria. Most people would look at that and say, that doesn't look so good. That looks like we've got leakage. But the contractor might say, thanks for the test. We'll see you in two weeks. Looks like we're good here, because there's no pass-fail. You've got to put the teeth into that. Um, and not only that is this particular method, which is ASTM 1186, has smoke, it has IR, and this, this device too, which is a bubble gun device. So once you want to understand before you put 10,000 masonry ties on, how well that is sealed or not sealed. Um, and it works, uh, it works fairly well for that. So in this particular case, we're just testing the field of the membrane and you put a bubble solution on, and then you put the cone of silence on there, which is basically doing nothing more than drawing a vacuum. And if you have bubbles, it's indicative of air, of air leakage. Um, but again, these, are, these are, could be systemic problems, right, that happen all throughout. And when we think of air leakage, the, the way to kind of get your hand or get your head around it is air leakage boils down to a, a, a hole, right? So it might be a hole like this or it might be a hole like this. And every time that you've got a crack or a hole, you start eating into your allowance. And eventually it disappears, unfortunately. So one of the questions was, how do you test big stuff? Well, here's a big skylight. We're testing a, a, you know, a continuous thing. So in this case, we're testing part of something. Um, this is another useful tool for testing big things or, or large area things. Um, and this is, a, this is dynamic water testing. I'm a 501.1. And so you basically can put this unit onto um, a trailer, and you can create you know, Hurricane Wilma-esque or down to just regular nor'easters where I'm from, and you can move it around the building and you can get lots of areas tested in a day um, if you have you know, big, big things to test or lots of, lots of locations you'd like to test. So that same unit that we looked on for walls also works on, on roofs quite well, so you can find holes that may be in the corner of TPO membranes. And uh, so my brother-in-law is here today, he he's works on lighting, and I'm pretty sure that when he looks at lighting and he looks at these uh, fixtures and stuff, he's not thinking I'm punching a hole in the air barrier. But if we have an air barrier on the soffit, that's exactly what's happening. And so we're having communication with electricians and electrical engineers, which had never happened in the past, because it has to work holistically, right? So um, field observations are a part of it, too. So we look at typical failures, um, you know, missing fasteners or laps or thin coatings, missing studs. Um, maybe some materials that are not necessarily dimensionally stable. It might look good after initial installation and then it might shrink back a little bit or you might have holes or so forth. Um, again, we talked about on-site chemistry and we talked about um, you know, trying to, to extend air barriers out to the proper location. Um, so what it lacks maybe in, in um, you know, full-time nature of presence, the commissioning process is a documentation-heavy process. So there's lots of programs that you can use to track not just site conditions or field test results, but also drawing and shop drawing comments that were made and to resolution. You'll be able to have a lot of zero defect projects, which is great. Um, it, it, but it does take a lot of work, and it takes coordination with those contractors and those folks that are on the site every day. So when you look at O&M, as maybe MEP is ramping up, we are, we're basically done on the enclosure side. At least you, you should be. So things like the whole billionaire test or maybe a thermal scan come into play at this point. But again, these aren't really useful tests in helping to, to guide better constructions. They're just useful tests in getting the, getting the grade on the project, right? Um, and so when you look at tomorrow's trends, uh, the geographic expansion is, uh, is a huge thing. So not just labor force, but also materials. So the, the palette of materials that are showing up on the job, job site um, are tremendous today. 
And so, um, you know, just be, be careful to make sure that you're matching the owner's expectations on durability with the product performance that you have. Um, we talked before about tighter schedules. Schedules, in, in my experience, has been more important than, than quality and more important than cost in most cases, most projects. And so if you can provide a solution for getting that sheet rocker to start working earlier, that's a solution that, that um, the, the project's looking for. And consequently, if you're doing something that might delay a project, well, it's not going to be looked on very favorably. So, you know, utilizing mock-ups again, I think this is where you have an opportunity to save time. So you're disconnecting that learning curve from the project schedule. On-site chemistry, we talked about this. I mean, the amount of uh, effort that we have to do to stay up, stay on top of this profession is tremendous compared to where it was 10 years ago. So I don't know how architects do it. I don't know how anyone in the room keeps up, and I, don't, and I dare to think what we're going to be 10 years from now um, if it goes on this same trajectory in terms of the number of new materials or combinations or things that, that folks want to try. Um, you know, the different ways of, of how we're joining systems together, the window-to-wall interface and traditionally done with sealants, and, you know, for a number of years now, we've done things with silicone sheets to kind of create maybe flanges that give you more flexibility, right? So if that architect wants that window to be proud or recessed, you can do that and not have to change the location of the air barrier. So things like that are definitely a common trend going forward. Um, getting uh, different materials that are maybe smart materials where they're physical characteristics change based on the ambient conditions. For example, it might be more humid, therefore it might be more permeable. Um, and so some of those uh, interesting things that we're seeing. I do think that the model accuracy is getting better. We have work to do. The models are certainly having more weight put behind them. So they are dictating design and, and owners and, and architects are watching the model closely to make key decisions about the project. And so I think we have an obligation to make sure that, again, those inputs are correct, we're speaking the same language, and that we're doing the very best we can to make sure that this model that's dictating these things is correct. Uh, and just two real quick case studies, and, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. Um, so uh, we spent a lot of time kind of more focused on the new construction side of things. What we've seen now is a real growth in existing building um, enclosure commissioning. And I think in the past, the thought was, well, the rate of return is just so untenable, we're not really going down that path. What we've seen in a lot of cases, you're getting into that attractive five to seven year payback, um, especially when you have a heavy TI, tenant improvement on the inside, or something where you can really access holistically the wall, either from the inside or the outside. In this particular case, 1980s building, and we were able to um, uh, rework, uh, replace the windows and put on an air barrier in the inside of the brick without touching the wall and get 10 times better air leakage performance, which is appreciable savings. They were doing an MEP um, redesign on it as well, and they could really uh, reduce the size of the equipment and so forth. Uh, similar scenario in New York City, 14-story building. And um, you know they didn't touch the facade at all. It was still new windows. In this case, we weren't putting spray foam on the inside. It was more of a vapor permeable um, air barrier that was uh, very carefully tied into the windows. And we were doing these before and after tests. We didn't do a whole billion air test in this case, but we did do a quantitative air leakage test on this very repetitive condition that happens literally three, 400 times on this building to know what we can anticipate in terms of differential between existing energy usage and, and uh, future energy usage. And so we did a mock-up here of both conditions, and that really helped the mechanical engineer 